And good evening. This is the Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund, which is found on the net at uh, jewish-socialist-bund.net. And uh, there's two pages that are made there. Second one being the JPLO uh, document of 1988, which uh, remade the Jewish Bund, and in fact... And uh, we're going to continue with the reading of the uh, very important study by Lars Fisher that is uh, published by Cambridge University Press and which is entitled The Socialist's Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State. That is during the time of the Second International, which is, of course, the same politic uh, on the Jewish question, so-called, that was carried over into the Third International and still persists today. So let's go share and um, and do the reading. Oh, by the way, I'm Dr. Abraham Weisfeld. And uh, I do um, have a certain uh, credit credibility by virtue of my studies at the University of Quebec of Montreal as a doctor, even though I haven't been allowed to have a position in teaching world since um, I worked at the Palestine Embassy in Ottawa during the Zionist invasion of Lebanon 1982 to 1985, at which time I wrote the um, documentary study on the massacre of Sabah Shatila and the refugee camps there. Okay, let's go and drop in on the socialist response to anti-Semitism. Here we are. Now we're uh, beginning today's uh, reading from page 169. And I believe we're at the heading, yet another great misunderstanding. <clears throat> The Congress, you know, the Second International Marxist International Congress, not only repeatedly touched on anti-Semitism and the Jewish question in general terms. In one instance, Mehring's personal idiosyncrasies in the field were even raised directly. Yet, just like the three examples we have just viewed, this again stood in no connection to Hans Luce and his stance vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. Had this really been a concern of Mehring's as silence, we would in any case be confronted with an altogether inexplicable omission. They had systematically combed through the past, his past, to find examples for his alleged duplicity and hypocrisy. One of the publications in which Mehring himself discussed his checkered past at length was a pamphlet we have already come across. Capital and Presse, as we saw, the capital and the news media. <clears throat> as we saw in the first chapter, it was in Capital and Presse that he himself related the fact that he had been accused in 1891 of writing anti- and philo-Semitic articles for different papers at the same time. Responding to these allegations, he had pointed out that he was responsible for at least two Jewish boycott calls against papers for which he worked. Hmm. How could we possibly explain the failure of Mehring's silence to utilize this material against him if we were to assume that their misgivings about his dealings with Luce hinged in any way on Mehring's and or Luce's stance vis-a-vis the Jews. Rather tellingly, we find the one perfectly direct reference to Mehring's own take on these matters, not in the context of the serious deliberations, but in the satirical paper that was issued on the occasion of the Congress and probably edited by Edward Fuch, 1870 to 1940. As far as I can tell, Fuch, 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 who was a long-standing friend of Mehring's and later became his executor, 
was already on friendly terms with Mehring at the time. In Teralia, this satirical paper just juxtaposed three spoof programmatic statements designed to caricature the different camps in the party. They sought to mimic, firstly, the radicals, and specifically Mehring's, Secondly, Bernstein. <laughs> Mehring is a radical? Okay. Secondly, Bernstein, introduced as E.B. in the Messianic Age. What's that about? What, Bernstein thought he was a messiah? And thirdly, perhaps a little surprisingly, Heinrich Braun, who was represented by drawing of an opulent money bag, this was presumably an allusion to the money Brown had recently made by selling his Archiv für Social Gesundung und Statistik. The text caricaturing, caricaturing, Mehring contained a rant about the press publications of Lob Sonnemann and Isidore Hagen. To the public imagination, both Lob and Isidore had strong Jewish and therefore pejorative connotations, and his satirical paper's spoof references to Love Schoenemann and Isidore Harden were clearly meant as an allusion to Mehring's predilection for these pejorative connotations. <sighs> okay. Mehring's quarrel with Hardin was in any case on the agenda, of course, and his long-standing enmity towards Sonnemann may have been an issue at the time, not least because the publication of the second edition of his Geschichte der Deutschischen Sozialdemokratie, History of German Social Democracy, was imminent. In this second edition, Mehring had finally let himself be persuaded to remove the references to Lob Sunman, still included in the first edition. Mehring habitually liked to refer to Leopold Sunman, 1831-1909, in this way, both in public and in private. He regularly called Sunman's Frankfurter Zeitung, the undisputed flagship of liberal journal journalism in Germany during the second half of the 19th century and beyond the paper of the Frankfurt Stock Exchange Democracy, Frankfurter Bossen Demokratie. On one occasion, he also referred to Sonnemann's challenge in the business section of the Frankfurter Zeitung as, quote, a Jewish democratic, not Kohn, but at least Kohnstadt, unquote. Okay. This did not go unnoticed, and it would seem that for once Mehring really was taken to task by at least some of his peers for his anti-Jewish jibes. Most likely, they consider this a matter of good taste rather than of genuine political substance. Whatever their motives, though, it is surely telling that it was this form they chose to take up the issue. It was the one form that, to put it bluntly, matched the seriousness of the issue, a satirical paper produced for the Congress in Dresden, a paper we might remind ourselves that, to the best of our knowledge, was produced by one of Mehring's closest and longest standing personal friends, not by his opponents. Least, lest anyone be tempted to read any more into this, we should add that this satirical paper contained many more relevant references. Among its ostensible contributors was one Professor Talmud de Edda. Edda was Bernstein's nickname. Both Bernstein and Luxembourg were depicted throughout with monstrous crooked noses. The satirical paper also offers spoof report by an auditor of the Socialistische Monatschefte. In it, the auditor vouched for the fact that the journal had acquired four new subscribers, 63 new contributors, one paid advert, and 127 new opinions over the last three years. 
and that it also pulled teeth and split hairs. The auditor's name was again, as ambiguously Jewish one, Isidore Mochtelis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's take a break now, and with the sunset, Hello. With the sunset, we can now light the Shabbos candles. Shabbos is Friday evening. For those who are assimilated. And here we go. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, asher kitzani mimitzotav bitzvanu lahadlik. Ne'ar Shabbos. Okay. Ah. Let's go and see What strikes me, in particular, with this analysis of the various so-called leaders of the Second International, is how ignorant they can be. And no wonder they never made a revolution, you know. That sort of strikes me as uh, rather uh, evident. Okay, here we go. Among its spoof adverts was one for a book by Isidore Cochin, Anti-Theoretical Theory of the Theory, with an introduction by Edward Granatstein, an obvious allusion to Bernstein. It is hard to conceive of a more blatantly Jewish name than Isidore Cochin, Cochin being the diminutive of Cohen, Conchin. Ah. This line of association then is this. Such obvious mumbo jumbo as the anti theoretical theory of the theory would obviously be the product of a Jewish mind and just the sort of thing for which Bernstein, supposedly Cranstein, would write an introduction. Another spoof advert praised a product called Bernstein Kobol, carbolic soap. No other product disinfects socialism so thoroughly, making it no longer in the least bit contagious. This product was distributed exclusively by the Apothek zur Hegelian Meshbuk, i.e. a pharmacy used using the Yiddish term for family in its name. Oh, Meshbuch. <laughs> the Holy Family. Was this perhaps an allusion to Marx and Engels, the Hegelica family? If so, the implication would be that it too was ultimately mumbo-jumbo of a stereotypical Jewish bent. <clears throat> That's what they call uh, Talmudic. To be Talmudic is supposed to be an insult for some reason. <sighs> I guess for people who haven't done any academic work. Okay. Without putting too fine a point on it, this would be rather telling in the light of our earlier discussion. As we saw, the passages in the Heilige family that revisited the Jewish question are particularly helpful in establishing Marx's genuine intentions in Zer Judenfrage. Meiring's Nach Lashaglab had brought the virtually unknown the Helge family back into circulation pretty exactly a year prior to the Congress in Dresden. Assuming the remark really was an allusion to it, 
it would give us some indication of the impression the Helga family now managed to make when and if it was registered at all. Mehring's best efforts in the introduction and annotation of the Nach Lashkab, notwithstanding, the Helga family would seem to have come across primarily as bumble jumble that may have had a young Hegelian inflection, but would nevertheless have done any Jewish sophist proud. All this was indeed meant as no more than a bit of harmless banter. This is made perfectly clear by the fact that the representatives of all the camps within the party are at the receiving end of the banter. Both Bernstein and Luxembourg were portrayed with Jewish noses. In other words, we are definitely not looking at an attempt by one faction within the party to utilize anti-Jewish stereotypes against another. No, it was just, you know, common anti-Semitism. <laughs> but how would and could this banter have worked in a party and a society, more generally, that was not pervaded with a wealth of anti-Jewish stereotypes? Exactly. Whatever the editor's subjective intentions, we know from Baring's research that the usage of these Jewish names was anything but harmless. To the minds of the Social Democrats, who produced and read this satirical paper, however, all this was indeed harmless banter, just as the references to Mehring's habit of calling Sonamon love was just a bit of harmless banter, and therefore found its proper place in this satirical paper, not in the deliberations of the Congress itself. Rather appropriately, the satirical paper's title was The Great Misunderstanding. Misunderstanding. Oh, yes. Yeah, racism is just a misunderstanding. Oh, a new chapter. Chapter 7, The Evolution of Bernstein's Stance on Antisemitism and the Jewish Question. Uh -huh. Okay, so we're up to uh, page 173 here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll continue in this session, and this is the uh, 21st session, I believe. Yes, the 21st first session of the reading of Les Fisher's work, published as the book, the Socialist Response to Antisemitism in a German Imperial State. Okay, let's take a break here. Maybe have some supper. Who knows? Anything can happen. Okay, let's continue. Now, go back to share here. Oh, oh. It's it. It's here. Yes. Okay. Sounds interesting. The evolution of Bernstein's stance on anti-Semitism and the Jewish question. <clears throat> As I indicated before, in terms of their sensitivity for the implications of anti-Semitism and the Jewish question, much of the literature has tended to place Mehrings and Bernstein at opposite ends of the spectrum. Mehring's attitudes have generally been portrayed as particularly ambivalent and problematic, while Bernstein's stance has been credited with an acuity and prescience fairly singular among his peers. I made it clear at the outset that I consider that this a rather questionable juxtaposition. I have argued throughout that Mehring's take on these matters, the occasional idiosyncrasy notwithstanding, was entirely in keeping with attitudes prevalent amongst leading imperial German social democrats. In this final chapter, I want to take another more systematic look at Bernstein's position to demonstrate that not only Mehring's approach, but Bernstein's too was rather closer to the mainstream of relevant perceptions among their peers than most of the literature would have us believe. <clears throat> 
the conventional juxtaposition of Meyrings and Bernstein is underpinned by a larger conceptual and ideological issue. Meyring stood on the radical wing of the party and died a founding member of the German Communist Party, KPD. Bernstein was the conceptual father of revisionism and died a respected doyen of mainstream social democracy as it had emerged from the split of organized socialist labor during and after the First World War. Neither the KPD nor the SPD of Bernstein managed to muster anything even approximating an adequate response to the renewed rise of political antisemitism in the Weimar years. Weimar years. Yet the KPD undoubtedly made an even greater dog's breakfast of its response to this development than did the STP, SPD. Some within the SPD clearly displayed a greater measure of flexibility and seriousness in their attempts to grapple with the rise of anti-Semitism <clears throat> than anybody in the KPD ever did. Among the communists, the ambivalent and starkly reductionist perceptions prevalent among Imperial German Social Democrats remained entirely unchallenged. The implication would seem to be that democratic socialism, so-called, allowed for an evolution of these perceptions, while the totalitarian character of the communism precluded this possibility. Hmm. All this became fully evident only in the interwar year periods, but it was prefigured, so the argument goes, by conflicts within pre-war social democracy and the contrast between Mehring and Bernstein then emerges as a paradigmatic case in point. It is perhaps little wonder that this notion owes its firm place in the scholarly literature to Paul Massey, who was, after all, a disenchanted former communist writing against the backdrop of the emerging Cold War. <clears throat> mm -hmm. As we saw, Massing strongly emphasized that Bernstein had supposedly cautioned not only Mehring, but the Social Democratic Party against ambiguity of language and attitude in the Jewish question. Yes, precisely. It's the ambiguity that is the problem. As a case in point, he introduced the proof text we discussed in Chapter 1. The article thus Schlaglagwacht in der Antisemitismus, published in Neuerzeit in May 1893. As I demonstrated, this text, in fact, did more to cement than subvert the logic underlying the prevalent critique of philosemitism. It also revealed that Bernstein distinguished less carefully than Mehring between those who had supposedly been duped in supporting the anti-Semitic cause and the actual anti-Semitic activists and propagandists. It is therefore very hard to see how this text could possibly have, quote, cautioned the Social Democratic Party against ambiguity of language and attitude in the Jewish question, unquote. Yet Massing maintained that it did, adding that this protest on Bernstein's part Quote, anticipated the disagreement with the orthodox interpretation of Marxism, Quote, that he would only formulate systematically in 1899. According to Massing, this demonstrated that, quote, the leading theoretician of revisionism was even then, in 1893, at variance with the radical, quote unquote, leadership on basic questions of capitalist development and socialist strategy. Jack Jacobs has argued along similar lines, but taken the argument a step further. He too interpreted the specific nuances of Bernstein's approach to anti-Semitism in the early to mid-1890s as early harbingers 
of the revisionist controversy. He then went on to suggest that, quote, the fact that Bernstein took the anti-Semitic movement more seriously may have been due to his Jewish origins, unquote, and a resulting, quote, subconscious identification on Bernstein's part with European Jewry, unquote. Oh, it's not allowed to have a conscious identification, right? Only subconscious is allowed in the Social Democratic International. Consequently, one needed to consider the possibility, quote, that it was Bernstein's psychological identification with the Jews that first led him to recess an orthodox Marxist position, and that, in this way, Bernstein's Jewish organization origins ultimately contributed to the development of revisionism. Whoa. Revisionism of Marxism? It doesn't center around the Jewish question. I mean, how can it be? It was around reform or revolution. Hmm. I'm sure he'll explain himself. Okay, we continue. This certainly does not tally with Bernstein's own account of his intellectual development. In a non biographical account published in 1924, he identified a number of debates in the early to mid-1890s that nurtured increasing doubt in him. He expressly mentioned three substantial review articles published in the Nyazite between February 1891 and March 1893, in which he had shown that the criticisms the authors under review leveled at Marx were wrong in certain respects. Yet even back then, he added, quote, I had to admit to myself that this did not dispel their objections altogether. Much as I tried to resist them, doubts were taking hold of me. The following years repeatedly raised concerns that reinforced these doubts Yet further, particularly important among these was a debate among German Social Democrats on the agrarian question that began in 1894. Oh, really? Unquote. The year 1894 also saw the publication of Engels' edition of the third volume of Das Kapital that, quote, questioned a number of conclusions that we pupils of Marx had drawn from the first volume, unquote. Especially its final chapter, quote, made an almost tragic impression on me, unquote. Clearly then, if we are looking for early harbingers of the revisionist controversy, we hardly need turn to matters Jewish. Yeah, that's what I thought. This does not rule out that they may have been among the concerns that reinforced his doubts. If so, may have had his reasons for not mentioning this in his latter account. It does not make it rather unlikely, though, that it was these, particularly, these particular Jewish concerns that first led him to reassess an orthodox Marxist position. Hmm. Well, perhaps yes, because, you know, if one thing is mucked up, then something else could be mucked up as well. Or rather, sort of, you know, distantly as own there, but nonetheless. Jacob's notions regarding Bernstein's development are, in any case, rather tentative. Subtle expressions of a shift in emphasis as early as 1898, notwithstanding, Jacobs ultimately concludes that Bernstein, quote, did not decisively break from his earlier positions prior to 1914. The decisive shift only occurred from approximately midway through World War I to the end of his life. And what it was, above all, the rise of anti-Semitism that precipitated it. For as Jacobs points out, quote, Bernstein repeatedly, and with notable prescience, insisted that the anti-Semitic movement of the 1920s was quite different from earlier anti-Jewish movements. Hmm. Interesting. 
Bernstein's recognition that the political antisemitism of the post-war period posed a threat of an entirely different intensity and order of magnitude was indeed prescient. Oh, let's take a break here. And Okay, that's enough for today. That makes uh, today's reading of 21st uh, reading from pages 169 to 175. Okay. It's depressing to go through all the mistakes. That's what one does to recognize what one must not do. <laughs> 